the history of Israel. But it's so much application for us and for us today. And I'm excited to preach this message. And I don't know how far I get into the message. Um, we'll see how the Lord leads. I'll try to limit myself to a half an hour or slightly over a half an hour and see how we go. But uh, we'll pray first. And the title of the message is Freedom is Costly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Freedom is Costly. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Then we can be in your house, and I'm excited to preach this word. And I pray that it's, it's, of course, my voice carrying those words, but I really pray that it be from you, Lord, not from my flesh, not from myself, not from my own thoughts, not what I even prepared, but that you uh, guide me in these words to build up your people in the most holy faith, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to correct us, to steer us, and direct us. Anoint these words. We ask that, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, an interesting thing is that um, there were ten plagues to persuade Pharaoh, the Prime Minister, sorry, the <laughs> King Pharaoh, <laughs> to let his people go. To let, sorry, the Israelites go. To let the people of Moses go, the Lord's people, the children of Israel go. They were in bondage. They've been there uh, when Moses appeared on the scene four centuries, 400 years. And uh, there's been promises given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and been passed on, of course. And then the sons of Jacob ended up, and that's a whole other long story, the message is uh, separate, but uh, ended up in Egypt. And uh, thanks to Joseph, the Lord used Joseph mightily. And the first pharaohs they lived under and ruled under were very favorable towards the Israelites and they remembered uh, Joseph, but then later on other kings came, more wicked kings, pharaohs, and uh, what has been created is the perfect communist society. They were locked into the land of Goshen. Now that word locking in is purely coincidence, people. <laughs> they were locked into the land of Goshen, close to a million Israelites or probably more, we don't know the exact numbers, but as some theologians say about scholars, between one and three million, we don't know exactly. But it was a huge number of descendants of Abraham uh, locked into the land of Goshen, and it was the perfect communi communist society. I've been uh, thinking about it uh, this week. It's like it was a completely locked in, controlled society. They were not allowed to come anywhere else in Egypt. Pharaoh was even trying to control children's childbirth. It's interesting, isn't it? Pharaoh was trying to control childbirth of the descendants of Abraham. Everything was done for them and provided for them by the government. Even Pharaoh instituted job keeper. <laughs> yeah, and um, this is serious. They kept them busy with building sphinxes and pyramids that are still standing today and I would call the sort of job keeper it, everything was done by the government the government was everything and the government was God because Pharaoh was one of these gods and if there's time I don't think there'll be time this Sunday probably next Sunday each plague was a false god being addressed it's going to be very interesting you have to listen carefully and Pharaoh was one of these false gods. And the whole philosophy was, everything comes from Pharaoh. Pharaoh is God. Government is God. And you're completely reliant on government. There's two people recently who said something interesting. One is the Prime Minister of New Zealand. He said, only listen to the government. The, the government is the only source of truth. I cannot find a purer form of communism than that. And then the health minister, Brad Hazard, interesting surname, um, he said the same thing, similar thing this week. Don't listen to all these other things online. Listen to us. We are the only source of truth. Liar. We have to address these things because the reason, and it starts awesomely looking like Nazi Germany 1933 
that not enough voices spoke up. Not with violence, we don't want any violence, but first of all, we've, we're not fighting flesh and blood for believers through our prayers. Praying for our Prime Minister, praying, and then we can't stop prophesying, we understand that, but that wisdom comes in here because our freedom, and that's why the title of the message this morning is Freedom is Costly, is being taken every 24 hours, there's a little bit more freedom mm -hmm. taken away, that is an interesting thing, and there's also a message of hope that the Israelites were delivered. And the Lord did take care of them in the midst of this oppression and of this uh, utopia of communism in the land of Goshen, when everything was done by government, everything, and they, they, the Pharaoh fed them, but do, what I, do as I say. So that feeding is almost like a job keeper, like a dull thing. You come completely dependent on the government, but you'll do what government says. Yeah. So how? Um, so we have these plagues. The interesting thing is that we find that, and I won't touch. I read every scripture in those chapters, but from chapters seven to twelve, we find these ten plagues. The other reason I'm preaching on this, that there's an amazing uh, similarity between the book of Revelation, the three series of plagues in the book of Revelation and the ten plagues in the book of Egypt. Yeah? And it's interesting, sort of, the, the book, uh, the first five books are also in other languages, and, and uh, in Dutch and in German, the first five books of Moses, in English they have other names. But, so the beginning of the scriptures start with what? Start with plagues, yeah? And the end of the Holy Scriptures end with plagues. And it's to do with the wrath of God, punishment on Pharaoh, on Egypt. Egypt, scripturally, historically, theologically, always stands for the world. I mean, New Testament and Old Testament talks not about Egypt. It's not only about Egyptians as people, as a race, but it's talking symbolically about standing for the world. Pharaoh standing for Antichrist, oppressing the people of God. Yeah. So they experienced bondage and oppression that endured for close to 400 years. And then when God sent Moses to deliver the children of Israel from bondage, and Moses is a picture of our Lord and Savior, he promised to show his wonders as confirmation of Moses' authority. And that's why the miracles the Lord, and the, unfortunately the Hebrews at that time didn't recognize it at large, but the miracles of the Lord Jesus were basically a portrayal of Moses, that the miracles he did, because of course they believed in Moses and the law of Moses, but they did not recognize him, the miracles were a confirmation that he is their second Moses, so to speak, to set their people free from bondage, but many did not respond or receive it. How similar are the days today? It says in, um, in Exodus 3.20, that's probably not the first scripture random, but I'll just see how the Lord leads on your list here. Uh, Exodus 3.20, it says, So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst, in its midst, and after that he will let you go. So this confirmation was to serve at least two purposes. To show the Israelites that the God of their fathers was alive and worthy of their worship and to show the Egyptians that their gods were nothing. It was twofold. And it's a similar in the book of Revelation. It's twofold. Or there's probably more purposes as well. But it's to show the world that God Almighty is truly God Almighty and every time in the end Every tongue will have confessed and every knee will bow that Jesus Christ is Lord. But they're gnashing their, treath, their teeth and cursing the Lord God even under the plagues. And they know where the plagues are coming from. There's nowhere it says in the book of Revelation is global warming or any sort of nonsense. They know where the plagues are coming from. And they're not UFOs or global warming. But they're cursing God who's bringing those plagues. And even here in this story we see that in God's grace and mercy, is even giving the Egyptians a reprieve and a choice. Because at first glance, you might think, oh, what are these poor Egyptians? 
they also had a choice, and it, well, I don't think we necessarily got there this Sunday, but at the end of the seventh plague, and then at the eighth, ninth, and tenth plague, there's sort of a little break, and the Egyptians getting a, uh, and the, the servants of Pharaoh getting a opportunity to bring their livestock and their families in safety, but many aren't listening. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So anyway, let's go back to Exodus three. How did it all start? And I want to go first to how it all started. We start reading in Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse uh, 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, Horeb, the mountain of God. Yeah. That's the first little part is, this is very important because this mountain keeps popping up again and again and again. And that's where he first met the Lord. And the first application I want to give to us this morning, if you feel that you lost a little bit of track, and Moses, he was not ungodly at that time, but he lost a bit of track, he lost a bit of passion, he lost a bit of, but you mean... Working for your father-in-law, can you think of anything worse? Um, working for his father-in-law, his family business isn't easy, you know. Working for his father-in-law in the back end of the desert, and he was this university-trained person. Egypt in that time had the best universities in the world. They already actually had universities. Nowhere in the hills in the world they had them. I mean, think of the, the mathematicians they had in Egypt to build these uh, pyramids. Even scientists today are scratching their head how they calculated all that, how it came out exactly symmetrical. So the Egyptians were very clever and very smart, and he was trained in their university. He, he grew up in the royal house of Pharaoh, and he was strong. He was resilient, he was strong, he, was, he had vigor, he, and he's like, he had a revelation when he was a young man that he was also a Hebrew, and he's like, I'm, I'm going to deal with this, I'm, I, I and my strength, I'm, that reminds me actually as a young missionary when I was 21, I'm going to save the world. And then Lord starts the process of making, breaking and making, I don't know which order, but both of those. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, uh, I hear uh, younger, uh, excited Christians and those who are even in ministry saying certain things and I cringe because I thought, I think you haven't gone through the experience, you just are maybe in, it's passionate in the flesh. We need to make sure that this passion comes from deep within, from our Holy Spirit within us and from experience and not just on theory. So the Lord said, yes, I have a calling on your life, but I'm first going to put you for 40 years in the desert. Now, I promise he won't do that with all of us, because the greater the calling, the greater the testing and the preparation. But there's a principle in here that if we desire to do something for the Lord and we surrender our lives to the Lord, the making and the breaking promise, uh, process is starting. So be blessed. Thank you for the encouragement, Pastor. So as soon as you um, it's like, your Lord, I want to serve you, I want to do this for you, the Lord says, okay, <laughs> I'm going to work with you. So he brings all these lovely family members and circumstances in your life, and you go, Lord, what's happening? <laughs> well, uh, you asked me <laughs> to prepare you. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, but I don't like these family members, but that's the whole thing. Or I don't like this, or I don't like my job. That's the whole thing. You, God puts you, and I'm talking from experience now, I'm trying to make it run away many times. God puts you in, a, in circumstances where you go, I don't want to be here, I can very much sympathize with Jonah. I don't want to be here, but God puts you, the Lord puts you in a place of making and breaking and forming and shaping and chiseling. And the Lord, it hurts. I don't like being in the desert. 
it's hot. All I do is watching these silly sh uh, sheep. And they never get any smarter anyway because they always walk away. You think they, they learn after a while. No, they don't. They keep walking away and doing their own thing. And you always have one sheep that escapes somewhere off and you're running out. It gets really old. That's, that's the life of Moses. How exciting. <laughs> See, that's, that's the background. And the reason the Lord called him after 40 years because he was not ready after 39 years and 364 days. <laughs> he was ready at the 40th year to hear from the Lord. So let us continue reading. And remember that man of Horeb because that's where his lights appear again. And that's where he received the Ten Commandments. And that's where he meets with the Lord again. It's interesting that if you feel you lost track of it, Go back to the Mount of Horeb. Go back to where you started. Go back to where you lost your track. Go back where you lost hearing that voice. Sometimes a lot of Christians say, I don't hear from the Lord anymore. Well, the Lord's still speaking, I promise you. You're probably not listening. Or um, there is a block. Not that God doesn't love you and that you're not saved. It's just go back to Mount Horeb. And of course, that's all symbolically. Go back to that place where you met him first could be a month ago could be a year ago where did you lose track and Moses lost track lost track 40 years before that he ran he fled he thought oh all my university education is useless which is probably true and um, and he just ended up in the in the desert there's no purpose for me see that's where the Lord will step in so verse 2 and the angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. In the desert you have these prickly little bushes, and they seem to have no purpose. And sometimes you think that your marriage partner or your, your children or your family or your job is the prickly little bush and all of this has hurt you. But even that bush that seemingly has no purpose, doesn't even have green leaves on it, God can use anything in your life for His good purpose. Romans, the book of Romans, yeah, for all those who love the Lord, He will use some things, now it says, he will use all things for his good purpose and for our good. Sorry for using that expression, but um, for his good purpose, for all those who love him. And he's like, go away, prickly bush. No, because the Lord wants to use that in your life to speak to you. Sometimes people say, the Lord, I don't hear from the Lord. The Lord isn't, isn't speaking to me. Yes, He's speaking to you all the time. Through pastors, through churches, through messages, through fellow Christians, through the Holy Spirit, through circumstances. And even He can speak to you through a job, to a, a boss at your job who's not even a Christian. The Lord spoke through a donkey. He can use circumstances. Oh, don't call your boss a donkey. That's not what I mean. That's not what I'm referring to. I mean, like, he can use any person, any circumstance to speak to you. And he looked. See, that's the other thing, is that many of us sometimes see something, or maybe we don't. It, what, what would have happened, a rhetorical question, if Moses, like, ah, oh, another burning bush. Hmm. Maybe this through the heat. Oh, I, I can explain this scientifically. Yeah, it's probably because of the heat and, yeah, and the, okay, bye bush. We need to sometimes be very sensitive to the things in our life that are supernatural. And there's something in here in this verse where Moses is saying, so he looked. We need to be very alert in these days. Are you looking? Are you searching? Are you knocking? And sometimes we're so quick to, when our car breaks down or something else happens, our first response is, oh, that's probably because of this and this. 
I've learned throughout the years that so many things that happen in the natural have a spiritual cause. You can't explain it sometimes. I've used this example just very many, many years ago. But I remember um, when uh, we were smuggling Bibles in a certain country, uh, I, we, we closed the curtains in, in the vehicle. And I was trying to use a torch that, of course, before we leave, brand new, fully charged batteries. And I go, it doesn't work. In Jesus' name, work. And, and we ended up using a, another torch, a smaller torch. And then when we were finished, or in the, in the next day, actually, I'm thinking, oh, I need to try. And it works. It's like sometimes you're trying to think, oh, this is all natural. The batteries were flat. Or whatever. You're trying to find an explanation for everything. A lot of things have a spiritual cause. We immediately, with our Greek scientific minds, we're trying to think, oh, that's probably because of this and this and this. Like, as liberal theologians say, oh, it was low tide when the Egyptian army drowned. <laughs> What's well, amazing to drown a half million soldiers in low tide. So it's a miracle regardless. So the thing is, are you looking, are you seeing? So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Is there still a fire burning in you? A passion? Yes. But we're not consumed as such. But you need to keep that fire going. And so many Christians lose their passion. Oh, it's so difficult. Well, what Bible did you read? Come to me and your life is going to be easy. Which scripture is that one? I haven't yes. found that one yet. Which Bible, which New Testament are you reading? Oh, it's so hard. The days are so dark, it's so difficult, or there's so much resistance. Yes, the Lord promised all that. The Lord said that. But He said, take courage. I have overcome the world. Take courage, and with me you will overcome this world. And that this applies to all times, to all seasons, to all people, to all backgrounds. So don't despair. When you see another dictator, uh, sorry, Premier, telling you what to do. Yeah. We will overcome. Apparently, we didn't know before how to wash our hands and what to eat and what to do. And anyway, that annoys me. Anyway, this is not part of the message. Um, so, first, verse three. Then Moses said. Then Moses said, "I will now turn aside." And see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. See, this is another key one. He first was looking, and then he turned aside. And turning aside is something that's very similar to turning around. He was willing to turn around. He was willing to investigate. I remember, I, I tried to avoid that, but a few weeks ago, talking to somebody... And he, he's just going on about certain um, things that we're experiencing right now. And he was all for that. And I said, man, if you will find... You, he, he thought that the things that are written on the, on the government websites are gospel truth. I said, no. Oh, that you need to seek the truth. And the truth, you will find the truth. And I think the problem with a lot of people today is that they don't want to dig deep. They don't really want to know the truth. It's so comfortable to be in this little communist society. I will now turn aside. And this is for us as churches and believers and Christians to turn aside and draw near to this great sight. What is this great sight? This great sight is not necessarily a burning bush, but for us it's the Holy Spirit within us burning. Turn aside. Turn aside to Him. Turn aside to this fire burning in you and take time to hear his voice seek him with all your heart repent of all known sins this is not the time to continue in on unknown sins or hold on to the past or not repent of your friends because for many it's the things that we do are our friends but they need to become our enemies in a sense so we can turn away from it I remember for many years ago counseling a dear um, 
I believe he's, he was a brother in Christ, but he was struggling with pornography and I was like, why, 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 why don't you turn aside? And then I was a very young pastor and I probably should have told, told him from the first time I started meeting with him, um, is it your friend or your enemy? I could have saved hours of counselling. Yeah. But I wasn't aware, and you all grow in the pastorship. And, and as long as it's something is your, your enemy, it's, it's a, a waste of time, like turn away from it. It needs to be your enemy, and it really needs to be something that you realise you're hurting the Father heart of God. You're hurting the Lord Jesus. He's looking at you from the cross. Or even a resurrected Jesus. He's looking at you. And my daughter, my son, why don't you let go? I have done it all for you. So when the next verse, when... I don't think we're getting far, very far in these chapters. No. But anyway, <laughs> that's alright. Then he said... Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I want to give us an encouragement this morning. Of course, in the Old Testament, you couldn't just approach God. Jesus, the blood of Jesus has not been shed yet. And the only reason we can approach and draw near, as we did in the communion and as we're doing in church and in our quiet time, is because of the blood of Jesus and our Heavenly Father, our, our God the Father, sees us through Christ. And now we're allowed to draw near. What does it say in the New Testament? It says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Draw near to God on Monday morning. Draw near to God. This Sunday is only a little injection. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong word. A little um, uh, encouragement, a little pap for the week. I didn't mean that on purpose. That, but you need to sustain your faith throughout the week. Draw near and He will draw near to you. The place where you stand is holy ground. When we meet with the Lord in church, when you meet with the Lord in your quiet time, you're standing on holy ground. It is not just Old Testament, it's also for us drawing near to, to the Lord. You're standing on holy ground. Oh, if we were just more aware of that, that it's not the building, it's not the church, it's not our inner room, it's not our study room, but when we draw into the presence of the Lord, it will change our lives forever. We can go through 20 million Bible programs and, and missionary schools and Bible schools and seminary. But the only thing what will change our lives is a relationship with our Lord and Savior and with Him and a daily walk with Him. And so many Christians, so many believers are sitting in churches these days and are being entertained. But they're not being told how to walk the Christian walk. And I fear for many believers, young and old, they are not ready for the last days. They are not ready for the rapture. They are not ready for the judgment seat of Christ. And it's not that they're bad people. We're all sinners. We're all lost. It is just what have we been fed? What have we been taught? Are we ready for His return? Are we ready for the rapture? There is an urgency to be ready. I don't think from my experience and lifetime and understanding of this, the prophetic scriptures is that we can't be any closer or hardly any closer in the light of church history to the, the rapture and the coming of the Antichrist. Everything that I see is lining up with the book of Daniel, with the book of Revelation and, every, and the book of uh, Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 24 is lining up with the thing that are happening. And God brought judgment to Egypt. He will also bring it to this world. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. 
and I, I'm not coming into the plagues yet. There's plenty of time for that next Sunday. But I want to encourage us with this. The Lord Jesus knows your hardship, knows your sorrows, knows your difficulties. He knows your cry that you quietly pray or maybe out loud in your prayer room, regardless, out loud or quietly in your spirit. He has even heard your prayer before he even said it. The letter has so many applications. As much as you heard a cry from the people in the land of Goshen, from the Hebrews, for I know their sorrows, I know your pain, and I will set you free. And here comes a key verse as an application for us today. Verse 8, So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land. A land flowing with milk and honey. A land of streets of gold. Pastor, why are the streets then crystal clear in the book of Revelation? Because pure gold is clear, is translucent. This is prophetic, even hidden prophetic, not directly. So I have come down to deliver them, to rapture them, because it happened overnight. Maybe close to three million young and old babies and senior citizens all together, all at once, Passover, out of the land of Egypt, which stands for this earth. The Lord comes, meets us halfway. 1 Corinthians 50, 15, 2. And in the twinkling of an eye. And he will meet his people halfway. It will happen suddenly. And the modern replacement theology, the Arminian theology is saying, no, the people of God will have to go through all the plagues. There's plenty of New Testament scriptures who say we don't, but this is another indication. The Israelites experienced the first three plagues. I'll talk more in detail about that next Sunday. And then the fourth plague, the plague of flies, mm -hmm. and who was Beelzebub in the Gospel? The mm -hmm. Lord of the flies. They did not experience the flies, I, I wish to know the secrets how we can keep flies out of our backyard because there was no flies in the land of Goshen. So as soon as there was like a hard border, <laughs> the flies were all buzzing around right at the border and didn't cross the border. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> to bring them up from that land to a good and large land. We're going, people. Sometimes I think we don't understand eternity, we don't understand the promises, we don't understand the future because so many Christians holding on to this earth. But if you see some of the most beautiful places in New Zealand and Australia and in the mountains and the Alps in Europe and I've been in all these places, you stand in awe of the creation. But if that's creation, how beautiful will it be yeah. with the Creator forever? Why are churches holding on so much to dear life and we're prospering here on earth? And that's important and that we will be blessed, but that's not the goal. The goal is eternal. The goal is to be with Him. Large land flowing with milk and honey. Now that won't be the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Persites and the Hivites and the Jebusites as it was then. It will be the place of the angelic host. And where we sing these beautiful songs, but also have a task. And many Christians don't realize is that we are not sitting on a little cloud with a little harp. The Lord will have a task for us. We have awesome things to do. We will be with Him and reign and rule with Him. If the Garden of Eden was so beautiful as described in the book of Genesis, it's going to be beautiful forever. No death, no destruction. But I read once in a vision about paradise from somebody who wrote a book about it. I don't know if it's true, but I thought it was interesting that he said, when you walk on the grass or the plants in paradise, they spring up right behind you. There's no footprints left. That's how life is in 
our new heaven, a new earth. Nothing is destructed. There's no death, no pain. Even the grass rises up straight away. There's no footprints left. Think about it. Behold, Selah, think about that. And in closing this morning, now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I believe based on this, um, this portion of scripture, that we as believers, that's just my thought, I don't declare this as absolute doctrine, but this is my thought, is that we as Christians will experience a little bit of that oppression that we already see coming. As the Israelites, we're not going to the Great Tribulation, but the Israelites experienced the first three plagues, and it was not pretty, very uncomfortable, but not deadly. And I believe we as believers, there's a similarity here for the time then and the time now that I believe that we are now in the foreboat and in the beginning of, so to speak, symbolically speaking, 10 plagues, and 10 stands for the number of fullness. We're now in the beginning and the foreboat to the Great Tribulation. And so I believe this message... Um, is an encouragement to us, but also a warning, yeah, and the understanding, and I think many of us do understand it, but be encouraged. The Lord heard the cry and the suffering and the prayers of the Hebrews, so he will also hear your prayers. And there is nothing, no pain on the inside or outside or in your body that he doesn't know about, and he is our heavenly Father who cares about us, and takes care of our coming and going. Not the QR app. He takes care of our coming and going. Let us stand to our feet. If we can, yes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That there is hope. And we have hope planted in us. We have a fire, a passion in us. We've seen, we've seen the burning bush. We have seen the cross. We have seen you, Lord Jesus. And we cry out to you, Lord Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, as our Master. And we're looking forward to that day and that we may hear from you. Well done, good and faithful servant, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.